Let me tell you a story. In 1825, American painter and inventor Samuel Finley Brees Morse, M-O-R-S-E, was commissioned by the city of New York to paint a portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, who at that time was the leading French supporter of the American Revolution. So Samuel Morse traveled to Washington, D.C. to paint the portrait. And while he was in Washington painting, Samuel Morse got word from his father by a horse messenger that his wife was, quote, convalescent, end quote, convalescent. And the following day, Samuel Morse got another note from his father, letting him know that his wife had suddenly died. And while Samuel Morse immediately left Washington, D.C. for his home in New Haven, Connecticut, by the time he got there, his wife had already been buried. And in his heartbreak and in his grief, that he had gone for days without knowing of his wife's failing health and ultimately of her death, Samuel Moores was inspired to explore a means of rapid, long-distance communication. And on May 1st, 1844, nearly 20 years after his wife's death, Samuel Morris again found himself in Washington, D.C. Only this time, he was there to hold the first successful, practical, public demonstration of the telegraph system that he helped to invent. And on that day in 1844, Samuel Morris was able to send a message from Baltimore to the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And with that transmission, the telegraph was born. In 1901, American educator and author and order and advisor to several presidents of the United States, our beloved brother, Mr. Booker T. Washington, he published his autobiography, Up From Slavery. Many of us read that in college, Up From Slavery. And in that book, Up From Slavery, Brother Booker wrote this. This is a quote. Often the slaves got knowledge of the results of great battles before the white people received it. This news was usually gotten from the colored man who was sent to the post office for the mail. The man who was sent to the post office would, just listen to this, this sounds like the brothers. The man who was sent to the post office would linger about the place long enough to get the drift of the conversation from the group of white people who naturally congregated there after getting their mail to discuss the latest news. And the mail carrier, on his way back to our master's house, would as naturally retell the news that he had secured among the slaves. And in this way, they often heard of important events before the white people at the big house, as the master's house was called. End of quote. That's from Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery, published in 1901. Now, this way of keeping up to date on current events that was used by Negro slaves was termed in our oral tradition, the Grapevine Telegraph, the Grapevine Telegraph referring to, we all know this, spontaneous word of mouth communication amongst people who could be expected to be found out in the fields amongst the grapevines. And in this same way, the Underground Railroad carried information about the movement of escaped slaves and their pursuers via a series of posts and checkpoints. And in these Negro-friendly, mostly Quaker homes where slaves could rest and refresh themselves before continuing on to freedoms at these way stations, information would be passed word of mouth. From person to person along this complicated network, which was also referred to and became known as the grapevine. And by 1952, colloquial use of the phrase grapevine telegraph had become such a part of popular culture that the phrase was first included in a U.S. dictionary that same year of 1952. And so one day in 1966, while walking along Michigan Avenue in Chicago, singer-songwriter Barrett Strong, Barrett Strong, that name may be familiar to some of you, Barrett Strong, He kept hearing the brothers out in the street saying, I heard it through the grapevine, yo. Hey, yo, I heard it through the grapevine, that X, Y, and so. Yeah, yeah, I heard it through the grapevine. And so Brother Barrett began sketching out the basics of a song with that slang phrase in mind. And he showed this framework of a song to Motown music producer Norman Whitfield. Norman Whitfield. 
who added even more lyrics and who really nailed down that key line in the vocal arrangement of the chorus, I Heard It Through the Grapevine. And on August 6th, 1966, producer Norman Whitfield recorded The Miracles and head of Motown, Barry Gordy, said, "Uh uh-uh, no, I'm not releasing that version as a single. Barry Gordy was quoted at that time as saying it was not, quote unquote, strong enough. So over five sessions between February 3rd and April 10th, 1967, Motown producer Norman Whitfield went back into the studio to re-record that song, this time with beloved brother Marvin Gaye. And guess what? Barry Gordy said, "Uh uh-uh. No, he said no to that original Marvin Gaye version of the song, too. Barry Gordy refused to release it as a single in 1967. So as the story goes, a few months later, on June 17th, 1967, in Motown's Studio A, oh, to be a fly on the wall of all the things that went down in Motown Studio A back in the day. But on June 17th, 1967, in Motown's Studio A, producer Norman Whitfield recorded the song, Yeah. Yet again, this time with Gladys Knight and the Pips. Now, after this third recording, Barry Gordy reluctantly said yes to a single. And on September 28th, 1967, the Gladys Knight and the Pips version of I Heard It Through the Grapevine was released as a single on Motown's Soul label. And by November 25th, just some two months later, that song reached number two on the Billboard R&B chart and stayed there for six weeks. And it also reached number two on the Billboard Pop Singles chart that same month. And one year later, on October 30th, 1968, Marvin Gaye's version of I Heard It Through the Grapevine was released as a single. And the rest, brothers and sisters, is history, really, because Brother Marvin's version eventually outsold the Gladys Knight and the Pips version. And rumor has it that Miss Gladys wasn't too happy about that. And it became the biggest hit single of all time on the Motown label. So in the first week of January in the year 1968, Gladys Knight and the Pips had a number two hit on the Billboard R&B chart with their version of I Heard It Through the Grapevine. And in the last week of December of that same year, 1968, Marvin Gaye had a number one hit on the R&B chart with his version of that same tune, I Heard It Through the Grapevine, a song that has at its roots and takes its meaning and its history in part from the oral tradition of Negro slaves in Civil War America. How about that, brothers and sisters? How about that?